Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized tonight's event. We've had over uh, 900 programs at the Commonwealth Club since the pandemic began, and we keep moving in and out of our studio um, at uh, 110 in the Embarcadero in San Francisco based on what's going on in COVID, and today we're virtual again. Um, but we have a great guest, Ian Morris. He's been at the Commonwealth Club many times over the decades. Uh, not quite as deep history as he talks about. We haven't gone back that far, um, but we, we definitely go back a long time. And he has a great new book, Geography is Destiny. It's been reviewed in lots of the top publications across the world. And he's got some big ideas for us about Britain for the last 10,000 years. Um, so first of all, welcome back to the Commonwealth, Ian. It's really always great to have you here. Well, thanks very much. Yeah, always a pleasure to be here. So uh, the first thing that I'd like to ask you about is uh, geography is destiny. Geography is not just in the way that you use it. It's not just the land. And, and the way it's shaped. So why don't you say what, what the geography is that causes the destiny of peoples? Yeah, I think there's two important things to think about uh, with geography when you're thinking about history. And one, well, you know, one is the, where the lands are and where the mountains are and the rivers and so on, the physical geography of places, um, which you know, by and large hasn't changed all that much in about 10,000 years since the end of the Ice Age and the mm -hmm. rivers and seas start settling down about 10,000 years ago. But the other side of it, um, is what the geography means. And the, the meaning of geography keeps changing through time. And so depending you know, particularly on the kinds of technology that people have got, the kinds of organization they've got, um, what your geography means can change very, very dramatically. And that I, I think that's really the center of the story I try to tell uh, in this book, how Britain's geography, the, how the meaning of Britain's geography has changed over the last 10,000 years. And what is that, what that's meant to its relation to the rest of the world. Well, before we go back, before the 10,000 years, because we want to go back there. Uh, first, your book has lots of great maps in it, really interesting. And of course, that's important for a geography book. Yes. Um, but then my favorites are on uh, page 32, and it is the, from 13,000 BC to 6,000 BC, four different pictures. How did the British Isles get formed? And I was surprised. I thought that I, I knew this, but I didn't know it. <laughs> How recently... The British Isles were formed 13,000 years ago. This was the, the, the land was much over the, the seas were much lower. Mm -hmm. And so it was all was all, you know, land all the way through to Ireland. I mean, there, there were there was, yeah. it was all one big chunk of the end of the European uh, thing. And then water came flowing down over those 7000 years or so and carved out the English Channel. Um, so why don't you talk about that? Because I think people aren't worried. As soon as you see the maps and you look at it, like, yeah, that's flooded land. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's actually, um, I mean, like, technically, there's been like three times this has happened, in fact. Um, like up till about 420,000 years ago, uh, if you walked between what's now Dover and Calais, you wouldn't even have seen much of a depression between them. It's all well above land, big solid piece of land there. And then about 420,000 years ago, there's a great glacial collapse millions and millions of gallons of water come crashing through what turns into the English Channel. Every second, they're crashing through there. And they eat um, this, this great big channel out between what's now Dover and Calais. And this is something the ge geology is so cool. This is the geologists are able to tell by scanning the bottom of the English Channel and looking at the shapes of the hills on the bottom of the English Channel. And if you get teardrop shaped hills with a kind of pointy narrow end of the teardrop is facing in the direction that the water came from. You can tell this ch is a channel formed by water crashing through and gouging out this channel. So you get this channel formed. And then um, the ice ages are getting colder and colder during this period, sucking up more and more water into the glacier, and the channel gets turned back into dry land again. Then about 160,000 years ago, it gets flooded again. There's another big tsunami, big collapse. Um, subsequently, it turns back into dry land again as we get new, you know, uh, mile-thick ice caps over much of the Northern Hemisphere. Um, the, num the number of gallons of water, there's like, you know, two lines of zeros if you printed it all out in the book. Huge amounts of water sucked away. And so um, the British, what, what we come the British Isles is basically, uh, in the book, I call it Proto-Britain. It's just like a big, fairly flat peninsula stretching out about a a hundred miles out west of what the western coast of Ireland is now. It's all dry land. 
Isles. So the British Isles are kind of absolutely part of the European continent. But then the, the most recent, the final up till now time this happens, it begins about 10,000 years ago. Once again, the glaciers start melting. This time it's much more gradual though. And the waters seem to have like they gradually will have put a big river down the middle of what the English Channel, where the English Channel is now. And the river will slowly have turned into a bog and then it will have turned into a chain of lakes. And little by little, it turns into a body of water that will become progressively more difficult to cross from one side to the other. You need a bit more bit more skill to do this. And so this final time, people had at least a couple thousand years to figure out, oh, this is, is separating, this is breaking away, and mm -hmm. this, this is going to change our lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that you, you talk about is uh, mankind in that part of the, what, the Proto-British Isles, and it's still a part of it. Um, how far back does that go? But you also have a very interesting idea that, that the ancestors of the British um, and the people who live there. Of course, there's all kinds of immigrants over the years and stuff like that, but the ones that finally share some DNA only have been there about eight, 10,000 years, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that's very yeah. interesting. Yeah, we, 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 we can be pretty certain you get something vaguely like you and me showing up in what becomes the British Isles by about a million years ago. And this mm. is one of these really neat bits of archaeology. We haven't found any of the bones of these people or any of their artifacts or anything. What we have found is a bunch of proto-human footprints and like a, a cliff got washed away uh, this is like in the mid 2010s a big storm washes away a cliff on the east coast of, of England and people walking along after this cliff has collapsed they see these weird patterns of depressions in the, the sort of hard clay on under what had been this cliff and it dawns on somebody these look like footprints so they call up the local county archaeologists these guys come out and say oh my goodness these are footprints and um, they know they've only got a little window here because it's just hard clay and now it's exposed to the elements it's going to be washed away and completely destroyed in a matter of weeks. So they leap on this, they make 3D castings and imaging of all the footprints. And I mean, you, you can't date a footprint. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. But what you uh -huh. can date is the mud that the footprints are pressed into. So they're able to calculate this mud is almost a million years old. So something like modern humans, vaguely like modern humans, is there about a million years ago. But then they go away. And then other modern humans, not mo as pre-modern humans, a kind of called Heidelberg man, these show up about half a million years ago. And then we've got a lot more evidence for but they go away as well. And then we get fully modern humans showing up certainly by 30,000, 35,000 years ago. Um, but those, the, the heritage of those particular modern humans, that has also gone away because there's no trace of it whatsoever in the DNA of the modern population populations mm -hmm. so yeah we want this is one of the, the great upheavals in archaeology over the last five or ten years it's been our ability to reconstruct ancient genomes and just get this whole it's like magic this whole new window onto people's lives hundreds of thousands of years ago so the group that was there thirty five thousand years ago or whatever the closest one um i guess it's assumed that when in the ice ages that they that it got so cold that they just moved south and, yeah. and, and left everything behind. And then the ice was so strong or, and, and it was so cold that nobody moved back there until after that started melting again. Yeah, well, you get this weird, it's really is a catch-22 kind of pattern that um, the kinds of technology organization um, a lot of kinds of pre-humans have mean that it's really difficult for them to cross a body of water 20, 25 miles wide, like the English Channel is uh, mm. for them in some places. Really difficult to get across that. The problem though is, um, the only times that it's warm enough for these humans to live in the British Isles, it's warm enough that the sea levels have risen and they can't get to the British Isles. Mm -hmm. When it's cold enough for the sea levels to drop so they can get to the British Isles, it's too cold for them to live in the British Isles. So <laughs> you, get, you get these little sweet spots where there'll be colonization coming up from the southeast into the British Isles and part of the Isles will get settled. And then cold weather returns. Um, and the uh, warm weather comes and the sea levels start to rise. Um, but the populations are isolated and cut off and they gradually go extinct. Or if it gets too cold, again, the same thing will happen. Sea levels will drop, but it just becomes too cold to live there. The populations again get isolated and go extinct. And this goes on and on and on. And um, it's like you know, if you had a, a time machine and you'd come from some other world and visited um, the British Isles around 100,000 years ago, you probably would have guessed that the long-term history of this part of the world is going to be these repeated colonizations from the continent followed by extinction events and the Isles sit absolutely empty for tens of thousands 
thousands of years. And what you might not have guessed, although I suppose if you're an alien clever enough to do that, you're probably a really good archaeologist too, and you'll figure all this stuff out. But what might not have been obvious was that the nature of the humans who are coming into the British Isles is changing as well as new kinds of humans keep evolving. Mm -hmm. And by the time you get fully modern humans showing up about 32,000 years ago or so, they are able to, they they have technology at their disposal that allow them to cross the English Channel. So like this final episode of the Isles getting turned into islands about 10, 8,000 years uh, BC, um, that final episode, that doesn't actually cut the British Isles off anymore. And in fact, mm. in its weird way, it actually has the opposite effect. The, the, the English Channel, it becomes a highway rather than a barrier. If you want to move, say you've got some pigs or some wheat or something, and you want to migrate to the British Isles for some reason from what's now France, it's much easier to do that in a boat than it is to pick this stuff up and carry it to the British mm. Isles. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the water actually becomes a highway rather than a barrier. Now that's very interesting because it's you know not not expected. But you're saying that the people that long ago had log boats or you know the same kind of versions of canoes and stuff like mm-hmm. that that the American uh, Native Indians had. Uh, that's that's what they had. They they had boats that's that right, could yeah. go right along the water. I mean, right along the edge. They didn't go out into the Atlantic. But no, no. What what happens? I'd say. Um, uh, I mean, there's you know, a lot of stuff happens in British history, obviously, but it really does boil down to three big phases. Um, mm-hmm. And the first of the phases, by far the longest, lasts from the time when um, the proto-Britain becomes the British Isles, lasts right up until 500 years ago. And it's a period when the technology available to put people, these simple boats, allow them to cross over the English Channel and settle uh, in these islands. Um, but the kinds of organization that people have got mean that there's, there's no organization out there that can stop anybody else from doing this. So basically, anybody who can get to the continental side of the English Channel is able to cross over to the island side of the English Channel as well. And the history of the British Isles throughout this long period, lasting right up to 500 years ago, basically, in spite of all the variation, is one simple theme, that British history is an extension of continental history. It's as simple Mm -hmm. as that. The English Channel is a highway, not a barrier, whereas the Atlantic Ocean is a barrier, not a highway. And for, Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a couple of minor exceptions, but basically people cannot get across the Atlantic Ocean. And so... For anybody living in Britain, you know, the British Isles, this is the edge of the world. You go out there beyond the British Isles, there's nothing out there. You've reached the mm. very end of the planet. Yeah, you, one of your themes is that, that all innovations uh, generally until the 500 years ago started either in the Mediterranean Sea area or the Middle East or what we call that. And then they made their way up towards the British Isles. So the British Isles were always, you know, the latest to get the latest yes. fashion, you know, the latest goods. But at least uh, by Roman time. Well, there was before the Romans, there's, there was the megalith missionaries, as you call them, uh, that, that, that brought something to it. Why don't you tell the megalith missionaries is such a great name? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you, you're absolutely true what you say about how um, the, the fact that the English Channel is a highway, not a barrier, means the British Isles are very much part of the larger European stage, but they are the, the wings of the stage and not front and centre of the stage. Front and centre is the Mediterranean Sea, it's the Middle East, it's India, ultimately even China. And basically everything you can think of as a big thing that happened in history up till 500 years ago, everything that happened began began off to the south and the east, away from the British Isles, in these big, important places where all the people are, all the wealth is concentrated, all the innovation is happening there. And so all of the new ideas about government, about religion, all of the new microbes, everything starts there and kind of spreads out from there. And because the channel is a highway, not a barrier, they ultimately end up coming to the British Isles. And the British, uh, as you say, British are the last ones to get everything. And it's a, it's a very mixed bag. I mean, you can tell the whole story really is about this process of um, unevenness generating between the centres of innovation and other places. Then the unevenness evens out. And sometimes evening out is this magnificent thing, like you know, get Renaissance art evening out from Italy and coming to the British Isles. That's, that's pretty cool if you can afford Renaissance art. 
And sometimes <laughs> you hear the Black Death evening out across your home, coming to the British Isles, and that is much less good because that wipes out half the population. But this is really, this is what the story is about for, for 500 years. And um, you, you mentioned the maps in the book. And what I do is that each of these three phases of history driving the British story, I try to sum up each of them with one map produced by people at the time, which kind of captures the essence of what's going on. Mm. And for this first phase, I use a map that now hangs in Hereford Cathedral. It's a wonderful thing, uh, painted around the year 1300. And the great thing about it is how it shows very clearly the British Isles stuck in the very, very edge of the map of Europe. It's actually quite hard to find them unless you know what you're looking for. And the English Channel is painted on this map as being narrower than the River Nile. The guy just really grasped what the great geographical forces that were driving the history of the Isles in his time. You know, it, you're, you're talking about the maps and how they, you know, show how people were thinking about things. You know, I've, I've seen a map, for example, looking out at the Mediterranean Sea from Venice, and it looks very, very different from the way we usually look at it. Mm. Um, but when I was, uh, I was in the Soviet Union uh, in 1973, and I bought a map of the world, and, and the Soviet Union, of course, is in the center of the map, and it's already big. But being in the center of the map, it's really big. You know, I mean, it, 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 it's just huge. And, and uh, the Pacific, something's got to give. So the Pacific, you know, is, is kind of big, but the Atlantic Ocean is squashed over to the side. Um, and I thought that the only way to be fair to the, to, to the Earth as a planet, you know, and so on, is to put the Atlantic Ocean in the middle, because that would make the Atlantic feel better as far as the Pacific Ocean is concerned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think the, the, you learn a lot about the world by drawing maps with different places at the center. <laughs> it really yeah, yeah exactly. Perfect. Well, you, you, you did a great job on that, too. As I said, the maps are great. So uh, let's uh, go back to those Romans. I mean, the, the Britons were way out on the edge of their uh, horizon, but they had tin, right? And uh, they had something that they wanted. And, uh, and the Romans colonized. Well, let's go back to the megalith missionaries because we didn't quite uh, talk oh, about right. them. Yes, I got and, then, yes. and, then we'll, and then we'll go to the Romans. But the megalith missionaries, you know, everybody knows Stonehenge, so, so uh, this is where that comes from. But, but there were plenty of others. It was amazing how many things uh, were done yes. with these big stones. So and why don't you tell us a little bit about these missionaries? Yeah, this is um, one of the most interesting interesting periods in British prehistory, that uh, the basic story throughout the, you know, all the way up to about the year 1500, the basic story is, like I say, Britain is an extension of European history. And mm. the, the history of the south and east part of the British Isles, what ultimately becomes England, English history is about what comes its way from the continent, whereas Welsh, Scottish and Irish history are about what come their way from England. And this is an unpleasant fact, but it is basically the driving principle of the internal history of the British Isles. The continent has the concentrations of wealth, population, power, um, sophistication. England is slightly less wealthy, powerful, sophisticated, and so on. And then the Celtic part of the British Isles, the soil is thinner, the weather is even worse than English weather, um, populations are smaller, um, and they're just always on the receiving end of what comes their way from England. And but they've been complaining about people, it ever since. Yeah, well, and they've been complaining about it ever since. Yeah, <laughs> and this uh, and it actually it does continue to structure the, the sort of internal strategic relationships in the British Isles very much yeah. by this geography. But this period around 3000 BC, this is one of the few periods when this kind of gets flipped around and um, all kinds of complicated reasons why it's happening. But the, the big thing is. Um, Travel from the continent over to the British Isles and communication. Um, the the what's normally the main channels for doing this across the Channel into southeastern England that really dies down, and instead you start getting these movements of people that we can trace nicely now through the DNA up from Portugal, the Atlantic coast of Spain, um, uh, south western parts of France, coming up from there around Brittany and then up the through the Irish Sea all the way up to the top end of Scotland to the Orkney Islands. Islands. Mm -hmm. And along this western channel, running up from Cornwall all the way up to um, the Orkneys, you get these amazing monuments starting to get built. And initially, they're inspired by continental prototypes, what people are doing down in Portugal, particularly what people are doing in Brittany. They've got these just amazing um, uh, columns and pillars and tombs they build in Brittany. So they start building these sorts of things in the Boyne River Valley near Dublin and Ireland. You get some similar things on the Welsh coast. Um, uh, spectacular ones up on the Orkney Islands. But then um, it's like 
the, the, some of the contact with the content begins to break down again. And people in the British Isles start inventing their own native versions of what's been imported from the continent. And they invent this whole new style of monument. We call it the Henge Monument. And the name comes from Stonehenge. Um, and uh, the sort of central idea of it is this big round ditch that you dig. But then it's not like a defensive enclosure. It's like if you want to defend yourself, obviously you're going to you dig a ditch and you pile up the soil on the inside. So your enemy's attacking, got to go down into this ditch, then charge up the bank and you're at the top of the bank and you throw rocks at them, kill them all and so on. But the hens just do it the other way around. They put the ditch on the inside. Which is just mm-hmm. ridiculous. You know, you're trying to defend that place. You've now got to get back across the ditch. Not good. So clearly, it's not a defensive kind of thing. It's a, a ritual thing. And so they build this enormous one at Stonehenge. And we now know beyond any doubt that the initial blue stones erected at Stonehenge were brought from a similar but slightly smaller monument in the middle of Wales. And they they dug up those specific stones out of an existing monument, brought it all the way down to Wiltshire, near the south coast of England, reconstructed it there. They brought with them um, several hundred cattle skulls from a feast that had happened about 200 years earlier and brought these to Stonehenge and reburied them at Stonehenge. They they really, really cared about these particular cow's heads. And Mm -hmm. the most popular (laughs) feeling about what's going on is it's sort of like a, a game of thrones type feasting thing going on here mm-hmm. that your, your prestige as a big man depends on your ability to throw these huge feasts and build up these alliances and of course in game of thrones they always end up with one side gets massacred at the feast yeah, they, they have these huge feasts and there's been some feast a couple of hundred years back that was so important that bringing those particular heads with them along with the actual stones from the monument where they used to do their ceremonies this is as your know, life and death kind of thing. So they do all this, they build this monument, and this for the really the first time in British history, one of the only times, we see the real centres of innovation in Britain, not in the southeast, not around the Kent kind of area, but off in the Irish Channel. This is the absolute mm-hmm. centre of everything in the British Isles. But then in the long run, geography always reasserts itself. Over the succeeding couple thousand years, once again, the centres of wealth and power shift back to what eventually becomes England. The English kind of appropriate Stonehenge. And um, well, this is a story that goes on and on as well. The English kind of taking over things that used to belong to the Welsh and Scots and Irish. <laughs> well, I think it's fascinating because this is like 5,000 years ago, right? Uh, yeah, that, that yeah, the, yeah. Stone, the Megaloth missionaries were there. That, that they actually had boats that would go all the way up from Portugal, all the way up there and we're yeah. investigating. And it was also right around the time that the pyramids started being built. I mean, that's about mm-hmm. the same period of time. So so somebody started building big monuments someplace in Europe and eventually, it, it, so that you think that that's the precursor of the Stonehenge and other, other big monuments. Well, I think right. one of the things we see happening over and over again is, um, I mean, I, I spoke a moment ago about this idea about sort of um, unevenness developing. You get centers that are usually down in the Mediterranean, in the Middle East, where people start, creating bigger and more sophisticated things. Like the world's first governments begin there, um, the world's first standing armies, the world's first taxation, you know, all these sorts of things begin there. And then through processes which can sometimes be extremely violent, so these things spread outward. And so you know, monument building goes back a very, very long way in the Middle East, probably to at least 9,500 BC. They're building these monuments. And mm-hmm. people further and further out the Middle East start building monuments until you get to the point people building places like Stonehenge and the British Isles. By that point, people back in the, the sort of cause of invention, creativity, back in the Middle East, they are building much, much bigger monuments. Like Stonehenge is big, but the, my goodness, the pyramids are really big. Um, mm. you know, the, the Great Pyramid in Egypt is still the heaviest building in the world. Up till 1883, it was still the tallest building in the world. I mean, these are mind-bogglingly big things. When you think that um, yeah, they're basically, they're built by people whose most advanced technology is broken rocks and the occasional copper tool. I mean, this is quite mm. extraordinary what people were doing. The amount of labor generated Generated. And, and I mean, even Stonehenge, huge amounts of labor go into this. We can tell from the DNA of the bones of the pigs they were eating. They're actually drawing in herds of animals from all over the British Isles to feed the workers at Stonehenge. In huh. Egypt, with the pyramids, it's even more spectacular. Yeah, that, that's that's interesting that you that you can tell by the food that they needed so much that they had to import the pigs from other places. Mm. Wow. And that they had oh. people able to organize it. This is the thing we, yeah. we hadn't really understood. People whose economic reach goes all the way up into Scotland from Stonehenge. It's quite amazing. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. All right. So the next big, big story uh, are the, are the uh, Romans. Um, and why did the Romans come? Why did they eventually get that far out? I mean, obviously they always wanted to conquer something more, but hmm. what, what brought them there? Because the, as you said, they were the outskirts of the, of the entire population in Europe um, and probably not the most sophisticated. As you said, it was interesting. The British called, I mean, the Romans called them Britannica, which means painted people. Yeah. Painted people. So, so when tattoos came back about 15 years ago, it was just a return to, to the, right. so, so, yeah. so the Britannica means the painted people with, with tattoos and everything. And so the British come and I mean, the Romans come and they, they create a pretty big civilization and a big economy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Now, one thing I take issue with you on, uh, you say oh. you know, the Romans are always trying to conquer something. They're actually not. Um, they're like, I mean, obviously, they're very good at imperialism. I and mean, they created mm-hmm. this empire that lasted for many, many centuries. They're thinking really hard about what they're doing. And like any good imperialists, they know that conquest. Quest um, brings costs and benefits. You, know, you take over a place and make it into a province, you can tax it, there's going to be trade, all kinds of benefits will come to you from being the rulers there. But there's costs as well. And mm-hmm. running a province is an expensive kind of proposition. And the Romans are very acutely aware of this. And so they have they have very, a very specific reason for coming into Britain in the first place. And so, so, so what happens, again, it's this old story of great innovations happening off in the Mediterranean base and, and um you get empires developing from at least 1,000 BC in the Middle East, and Romans start building one in Italy by about 500 BC. Um, they, for various reasons, it's spreading out into Europe. And then Julius Caesar. Um, Julius Caesar is a you know, very prominent Roman, gets himself into a real mess. In the- <laughs> He's a very big guy in Roman politics, and this is a life and death business. I mean, obviously, we're all rather concerned with American politics at the moment and the nastiness and the viciousness and the violence. Oh, boy, we, we're with kids, absolutely. <laughs> Roman politics was definite life and death business. So Caesar played for the highest stakes on the planet, um, and he gets himself in the situation, he's run up these mind-boggling debts that even somebody like him could never possibly pay um, in his quest to get to the top. And so uh, he persuades the Senate to vote him this military command. That They then switch to a different command. And he looks at this new command, which is in the southwest of France, and he thinks, you know, if I were to invade the middle part of France, boy, there'd be a lot of money and glory and fame would come from that. I could pay my debts. I would be a really, I would be kind of safe again, which is mm-hmm. ridiculous because when you play this game, you are never safe until you're dead. Um, mm-hmm. But anyway, he's I'm just going to do this. Goes into central, well, Gaul, as they called it then, conquers a bunch of people. Good reasons to do this because there is a lot of wealth in Gaul. These are fairly sophisticated communities there. And they're building sort of cities already, take over their trade networks. Pretty sensible thing to do in a lot of ways. So so Caesar does all this. And then he runs into this problem, gets into northern Gaul, and he discovers um, there's a lot of genetic cultural ties between people in northern Gaul and people in southern Britannia. And he'll beat up some tribe of Belgae in northern Gaul. They just jump in their boats and go across, across to Britannia, wait a couple of years and come back with all their relatives and start plundering again. So he says, OK, th- this is not going to work. And so he says, I need a, a secure frontier. I have like an open frontier frontier basically on the English Channel because it's so easy to cross. I've got to close that frontier. How do I do that? Uh, uh, one option would be you go across and you conquer the whole of the British Isles. But that is hugely expensive and um, uh, not obvious that anything in the British Isles, there's anything there that can really pay for an operation on that scale. And so Caesar, I mean, we're guessing a little bit. We, we know a lot about what Caesar thought because he wrote all these commentaries, but he's a politician. So mm. you, you know, a priori, you cannot <laughs> word he said. <laughs> so uh, we think that what he always has in mind is to just go across the English Channel in 55, 54 BCE, beat up the natives a little bit, find some cooperative local guy and say to him, hey, why don't you be my man? And I will make you a king, not a chief anymore. You're now a king. And Rome loves you and will give you all this cool stuff. And in return, you keep everybody else in line and make sure they don't harass me and cross the channel and so on. And then you win, I win, everybody's happy. And mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a very old strategy. This is not wildly different from what the US wanted to do in Iraq in 2003. The last mm-hmm. thing we want is to occupy this damn place because it's going to cost a fortune. It's going to be catastrophic for domestic politics. We want to go there 
over those Saddam Hussein, put in some guy who'll do what he's told and keep everybody quiet, which he does not. <laughs> nice job. No super <laughs> well Caesar either. And so the Romans end up, um, they, they decide by a hundred years later, they decide, yeah, that didn't work very well. We've got to conquer something. But then the big question for the next really century or so is, well, what do we have to conquer? We want to calculate the ideal tipping point where we've conquered enough that gives us this strategic and keeps people out, but also not so much that it doesn't pay for itself anymore. And we've got to mm-hmm. work out where is that line? And they spend really a hundred years trying to figure out where is the line. They consider conquering the whole of Scotland. They actually marched to the northern tip at one point. Um, they possibly sent armies across to Ireland at one point. It's not, not entirely clear. Um, mm-hmm. But geography always kind of has its way with people. And the, the frontier keeps funneling back to roughly the same place, which is roughly where Hadrian's Wall ends up, roughly on the England-Scotland border now. England, Wales, not Scotland, Ireland. So mm-hmm. it gets this, these sort of geographical principles run through everything, but what the geography means keeps changing as the technology and the organisation changes. Well, you, have a, you just described one of the concepts that you talk about, counterscarp. Um, that is, you know, you, yes. you've got to have some land that protects the other land that you really want. <laughs> so That's so true, it's a bu- yeah. like a buffer zone. So exactly. So so Britain was a buffer zone, basically. You were saying. Yes, a lot. A lot of the later parts of British history are all about Britain's attempts to create a defensive zone on the continent. But um, back in the first century BCE, CE, um, you know, the, the real driving player is the Romans. So they're looking at this from the continent and they see Britain as being the buffer. And this term, counterscarp, um, this is a, a word I borrowed from a guy named William Cecil, who was Queen Elizabeth I's main advisor. Mm-hmm. And in 1567, he says to Queen Elizabeth, what we need to defend defend England against these powerful, scary French people and Spanish people is what, what they call a counterscarp, which is like the outer ring of defences in a fortification around a fortress. He says, you've got to build a counterscarp on the European continent. And what that will do is stop continentals from getting all the way to the English Channel. Because the minute they get there, there's really nothing you can do to stop them crossing over it into England. Because, mm. well, at least before 1567, the technology does to allow you to blockade enemy fleets in their harbours. Mm-hmm. There's nothing like what we now speak of as command of the seas. That just doesn't exist. And there's no mm-hmm. government can possibly raise the money to pay for that, even if we did have the technology. So yeah, this counterscarp idea, this really runs through the whole story. Yeah, it's a very interesting. And then we'll, we'll back up again to, to the Romans. So the Romans were in charge for quite a while, um, but then they started to collapse back in Rome, and then that that it made everything retreat. Not unlike other collapses that have happened uh, recently, like when the Soviet Union collapsed, everybody mm-hmm. retreated back. So they retreat back. The Brits are left alone uh, or or on their own. Um, and then you 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 say there's the first European Union. I thought it was a very interesting way of saying it, and it was a soft power rather than a hard power. Mm-hmm. Why don't you describe it? Because I thought that was a very interesting way of looking at at, at that institution. Yeah, well, I mean, when I was writing the book, I mean, I, I should actually back up for a moment. I I started writing this book on June the 24th, 2016, the morning after the British voted to leave the European Union. Mm. And uh, that was uh, the sort of the main reason for doing that was um, I'd written several books before this one, uh, trying to look at long-term global history, understand the big forces driving global history. And um, I had a lot of fun writing these books, but some, a little voice kept going in, in the back of my head. It was my professionally trained historian's voice, which kept telling me, you know, all this stuff about grand and personal forces driving world history over thousands of years, that's all fine and good. But real history is made by actual people, you know, living actual lives. And so if you can't use these grand theories to try to explain um, specific events that happen, um, they're not a lot of use. So I've been thinking for some years, you know, what I need to do is write a book where basically I take this, this big history, this history across millennia, take the big history and use it to answer a little question, something specific and concrete that happens. And so I'm thinking, you know, what would be a good case study for big history, little question? And then you know, the British, in their wisdom, decide they're going to leave the European Union. And I think, mm-hmm. aha, 
perfect kind of question um, for me to tackle using this approach. Does the long-term geographical perspective help you understand the British decision to leave the European Union in 2016? Mm. Uh, of course, I came to the answer yes, otherwise I wouldn't have written a book about it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway... Now, you're not saying that right. you could have predicted, you're not saying that you could have predicted the vote of 53 to 47%. Ah, uh, no, no. Oh, okay, it's no, not that. I, I just want to make sure. Say, what I think should have been more obvious to people, if they had thought about long-term history and right. looked harder at geography, it should have been more obvious to them that this was a real and legitimate set of arguments on the part of the right. people who wanted to leave the European Union. It wasn't this crazy thing. It's a 10,000-year-old argument. But anyway, I mean, as I get writing the book, people keep saying to me, OK, you're writing this 10,000 year history of Brexit, basically. Also, right. Are there any good analogies for Brexit earlier in history? And the, the obvious one that people would often jump to is Britain leaving the Roman Empire. But that's actually a terrible analogy because the mm. Roman Empire was an empire and the EU is not an empire. Uh, an empire is an organization based on the use of violence, military force. So the Britannia, the province, tried to leave the Roman Empire multiple times. What do the Romans do? They come across to Britannia, they kill thousands of people, they crucify hundreds, sometimes thousands, they burn down everybody's villages, they sell into slavery everybody they can find. Now, the EU has played somewhat hardball since 2016, but they're not. <laughs> Yes. They don't do this because they're not an empire. Um, or if they are, the most you could say is it's kind of an empire of mind, or an empire of soft power. Mm. And I think that there is a kind of analogy, which I think is very useful for thinking about longer term British history, between the European Union and the Catholic Roman Church. Um, mm. so the Catholic Roman Church, again, it's not an empire. And, you know, it's, um, it's an organization based on soft power. And the distinction social scientists like to make, they say hard power, that's military and economic. And so like, I want to get you, George, to do something for me. You won't do it. If I've got hard power, I can threaten either to beat you and send you to hospital, and maybe that will recalibrate your thoughts on this question, <laughs> or maybe I can bankrupt you and drive you out of your home or something, take your job away. And again, that focuses your mind nicely. So basically, hard power is threatening and bullying. Soft power, though, soft power is like it's making somebody wants to want what you want. And so I like, say for this, for some <laughs> inexplicable reason, you think I am absolutely fabulous and everything about me is great. I don't have to threaten you. I just say, oh, gosh, <laughs> it's so great for both of us if you, you know, do whatever you want. And, and, and it's, there, right? you, there's, it's much yeah. more likely. There's no guarantees. It's much more likely you're going to say yes. And mm -hmm. the hard and soft, of course, go, in reality, go together. Right? The more soft power you've got, the less you have to use your hard power. And the more you've got hard power, the, the more convincing your soft power sometimes seems. So these things don't go together. But the Catholic Church, the EU, these are empires of soft power. You know, the EU says to the rest of the world, look how great it is in the EU. I mean, look at the, the prosperity, the safety, um, the culture, just all these great things. Who would not want to be part of the EU? You should really like us. You should do what we want you to do because it's going to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. And the Catholic Church says that kind of on steroids. They say, all we want to do is save your eternal soul from burning in the flames of hell forever. How can you not want to work with us? And I think it's a pretty <laughs> big moment. Uh, but of course, it comes at various costs. And so when um, Rome was expanding its soft power in the 5th, 6th, 7th centuries CE, the, what they're doing, they're basically offering this deal to people. They say, here's the deal, George. Um, you sign up with us and you were gonna, you're going to have to surrender some of your sovereignty because we're going to send people to come and live in your, your kingdom and they're going to take over large parts of your territory because they're going to be talking to the top men and saying to these top men, if you give a lot of money to the church, we will say prayers in perpetuity for your soul. You'll get time off in purgatory. So all this land is going to flow into our hands in the church. And we're going to bring in canon law and say, anybody works for the church, you, the king, you can no longer judge these people. Only the pope and his representatives can do this. All this sovereignty you have to surrender. You have to give up a lot of your identity because your people might now start thinking themselves primarily as Catholics, not as um, people from Wessex or Mercia or whatever. So you're giving that up. You're giving up a lot of prosperity as well. You're just giving up a lot of stuff. But what you get back, um, mm -hmm. you get back while well, your soul gets saved. That's really good. But also you get access to 
see the sophistication of the Catholic Union. Um, so the Catholic has got all of these literate priests. And if you want a really good kingdom, you don't want to have to be stealing stuff all the time. Um, you, you do want to steal stuff because you're the king. But if that's your only source of income, that's bad. You want to tax people, particularly trade. You want to tax trade. You really need all these literate guys. And only the church can do that. Only the church can come in, set up these schools. If you're not Catholic, there's no way your son is going to be able to marry the daughter of a Catholic king. Just no way. Mm. And if you mm. can't do that, then you're not part of all the big peace conferences, all the big deals that are being cut. And it's such an attractive deal that basically everybody in Western Europe signs up for this deal. And so they create this thing. And again, you know, certain similarities to the European Union. It, it's the biggest and most sophisticated organization in Europe by far. It's got all the money, all the most sophisticated thinking going on there. It can solve all kinds of problems that are just very difficult to solve by force. Um, it, the way it solves problems as well, very like the EU, um, it doesn't send an army to make you do what it wants. It sets up a committee and the committee <laughs> sets up a subcommittee. And the subcommittee sets up working groups and it goes on and on and on. And basically they talk you to death, which is, I mean, it's great reading early accounts of the 50s and 60s, of, um, I, I, the 70, 1970s of British politicians having to deal with the European Union. It's just like reliving Anglo-Saxon times. They say, my God, these people, they talked us to death. We agreed to all these things with a common agricultural policy because we couldn't bear to sit in another meeting for another minute. So yeah, there's some huge differences in the church, but really the, at an abstract level, the way they function is very, very similar. So the one real analogy for 2016 is not the end of the Roman Empire. It's Henry VIII taking England out of the Catholic Church in the 1530s. That does have some similarities that are, if they weren't so sad, they would actually be quite comical. Yeah. Yeah, um, just one uh, update. So when people say they want to put Sharia law in for the, you know, the one million Muslims or whatever that are in the country, isn't that a little bit like this canon law? I mean, your, your canon law is there, only you can't touch our priests. We're going to take care of our own people inside your culture. You think it's a similar yeah, emotional reaction against it? It is. It's, it's, a, re, it's a recurring thing that, um, that uh, you know, countries, political organizations do to each other. Like, so when the British shoot their way into China in the 19th century, in the 1840s mm -hmm. onward, one of the things they always insist on is extraterritoriality, which means that any British trader operating in a Chinese port is subject to British law, not Chinese law. Mm -hmm. And this is a really common thing. I mean, one of the big... Um, objections to the American military presence in Okinawa was the fact that American troops would be tried by American courts under the American legal system. Mm -hmm. So uh, a series of you know, nasty incidents of rapes and fighting and stuff where there's basically nothing the Okinawans could do about this. And of course, this is something, if you are a great power dealing with a politically weaker power, this is something you really want to impose. So you can guarantee that the agents you send to these countries um, can be brought home, not left to rot in a, a Russian prison or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, a bit more. It's a bit more of a hard sell for Muslims in Britain to demand Sharia law for mm -hmm. treatment because they don't have somebody coming with a lot of guns to shoot the British if they argue with this. So um, mm -hmm. I think it would be you know, quite a remarkable thing if it was um, agreed the other way around. Yeah. All right. Um, so you mentioned Henry VIII for a little while. Uh, for you know, just one short, and we're going to have to skip over a bunch of uh, period of time so that we can get to the present uh, since we we're at six fifteen already and. Uh, you called his uh, exit from the Roman soft power, which was, had been soft power for a thousand years, um, as angle exit. Um, <laughs> you coined the word. So his, his exit, and a lot of people say, well, look, you know, as soon as he exited, then he stole all the monastery's wealth and everything. But you're saying, no, no, that was one of the driving forces. It, it might have, the sun, sun might have been the, the, the uh, obvious thing that was put forward. Mm -hmm. But he really needed that money. And, and as you said, you know, so many people have been giving money to the church over the ages that they owned a lot of land. How much land did they own? What percentage of the land? It was, it was like a third or something. Yeah, outrageous proportion of the land, yes. And between yeah. what the church owned and what the crown owned, it's not a heck of a lot left for other people to own. But right. yeah, and so because yeah, Henry VIII, as you say, is a thousand years after the Roman Empire retreats from Britain. And 
but all of that stuff in between, in a way, that thousand years, it's basically the same story played mm-hmm. out in different ways as people, different groups within the British Isles, because now it sort of breaks up to England, Scotland, increasingly into England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, right. all fragmented internally. They're all trying to figure out what is the best way for us to relate to the continent in a world where the continent remains the center of all the big new things that are happening, but there's no counter scarp of any kind anymore. And we can't relate to the continent through having a, a, an actual empire like the Romans governing us. And the Catholic Church gives us this sort of soft power union like the European Union is uh, in recent times to some extent but we've got to figure out ways to continue relating in all, all the other ways in our life and um, it, that that storyline, this really begins to come apart round about the time of Henry VIII and, mm-hmm. and um, as you say the, the reason Henry leaves the Catholic Church famously um, his wife Catherine of Aragon is getting older, she has had a daughter but the son just keeps not coming and Henry, actually wrongly, but Henry is convinced that if I don't have a son, there's going to be civil war. Uh, he mm-hmm. looks back to the last time a, a woman succeeded to the crown in the 12th century, there was civil war. He says, oh no, we can't have that, gotta have a son. So that means, gotta get rid of the wife. Mm-hmm. Now, um, because they're Catholics, uh, and we, we normally tend to assume, oh, that means you can't divorce. Didn't actually mean that. Um, no, no. <laughs> you could always get a divorce if you knew the right people, had enough money, uh, everything can be worked out. And so Henry is absolutely confident he's going to be able to get his divorce. Um, the problem is... Uh, you can always get your divorce, but it, again, it's going to be a deal. So the people in the church are saying, well, OK, we can give you what you want, but what's in it for us? And with Henry, they keep thinking, we can squeeze a little bit more out of this guy. Yeah, we're not at the bottom of his purse yet. We can get a bit more from him. And so they, they keep the church <laughs> keeps playing hardball over the divorce, keeps saying no. Uh, until this disaster happens, the Pope gets captured um, by the Spaniards. And um, the King of Spain, it gets a bit complicated, the King of Spain is the nephew of Catherine of Aragon, who is the wife that Henry wants to get rid of. So mm-hmm. now he's got the Pope in his hands. There's no way the Pope is going to grant a divorce now. And so all of these, and again, the similarities with Brexit start to, to crop up here, because both stories are driven by forces which are not really connected to what ultimately happens. But in both cases, you've got British leaders who are unable to get what they want um, through a regular, what should be a straightforward negotiation. And when it falls to the ground, more hardcore advisors start to come out of the woodwork. So these guys start telling Henry, you know, Henry, sire, you know, sire, um, you're hmm. not really subject to the Pope at all. You are only subject to God. As king, you are the you are the legitimate representative of the English in God's eyes, not the Pope. You can just tell the Pope to go home to Rome. You can separate yourself. You can take your country back from the Romans. Hmm. And Henry is very reluctant to do this because he sees what tremendous cost there's going to be for it. But he hmm. Actually, gets shoved further and further in that direction through this series of disastrous misjudgments and sort of ludicrous accidents. You're a bit like the what leads David Cameron in 2013 to say he will put EU membership to a vote if he gets yeah. uh, re-elected. He's convinced when he says this that he's going to get back into government, but only as part of a coalition. And then he can say, oh, I promised you a referendum on the EU, but mm-hmm. I'm sorry, I can't give it to you because my uh, coalition partners won't let me. So he <laughs> make this promise, never going to happen. And Henry VIII, he's a little bit similar. He thinks he's never actually going to come to it, but good Lord, it does come to it. And they sort of tumble out of the EU and again, yeah. out of the Catholic Church. And again, like the British in the 2010s, the English in the 1530s, they really have no idea what they're going to do next. The no serious planning has been made for this eventuality with disastrous results in, in both cases. Um, but so uh, Henry, I mean, this decision, though, it's like in some ways this is entirely the, the fault or to, to the to the Henry's either to be blamed or congratulated for taking English England out mm. of the Catholic Church, making it a Protestant country. But in other ways, it's like it's not really him at all. Because like if you ask yourself, what would have happened if Henry VIII had not needed a divorce or mm. had not started having sex with Anne Boleyn a little bit sooner than he should have done? What would have happened? <laughs> um, would he have taken England out of the Catholic Church? And the answer is probably not in the 1530s, almost certainly not in the 1530s, mm-hmm. but 
all these other countries which don't have these divorce problems going on, they all leave the Catholic Church as well, independently from England. And mm-hmm. the reasons they've got, England has a lot of the same reasons. And like you said, the money is a really big one of them. Mm-hmm. And like in the, the, the Brexit discussions, Boris Johnson was always talking about all these hundreds of millions of pounds Britain would reclaim from the EU every day by no longer paying all these dues. And it's all turned out like so much of what he said to be sort of fantasy world. Mm-hmm. But Henry VIII state, the English really did reclaim spectacular amounts of wealth by leaving the Catholic Church and <clears throat> taking over the monasteries, taking back all the land. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a weird thing. Like all analogies, there are these major and important differences. But the similarities, I think, are really suggestive in some ways. In some way, what you're saying is that Luther was, Martin Luther was the one that, that turned the key that allowed the, the soft power of the Catholic Church to go down because it made it possible for the other countries to, to you know, to leave and take the money, um, at least on the outskirts. Again, it was the outskirts that did it first, uh, as you yes, said, because yes. Scotland, uh, you know, Wales, et cetera, England, these, these aren't the center of what it was. The, the ones that are closer to the center, Spain, even mm-hmm. France, uh, Italy, they all stayed Catholic. They're still, still Catholic, basically. Yes. Right? Much. So, um, so we have a lot of 500 modern, you know, history in here um, and we don't have enough time to cover it all. It was really, really, uh, you know, fun, um, fun how the British Empire, you know, took on India. I, I really liked your maps about the different versions of the United Kingdom starting around a thousand, you know, the United Kingdom that included parts of, of Denmark and so on. So we'll leave that for, for the readers to see how, how that moved and shaped and re- removed and reshaped. Um, and, and bring us down to the current time, because uh, we've got the British Empire uh, ruled the, the world pretty much uh, for a long time, with so, mostly, mostly with soft power, but obviously with a lot of hard power behind it. Um, and, and the two world wars put an end to that, basically. Um, another detail for readers to check on, very fascinating information about the financial uh, rearrangements between the United States and Britain that are going on behind the scenes and the political one and the pressures that each one put on. I, one, one that I think you should mention out loud uh, is that the Brits went after the nuclear weapons, not so much as a defensive move, but as a blackmail move against the United States. That's right, yes. Do you want to explain that? Yes, having enough nuclear weapons that the Americans couldn't afford to ignore what the British wanted. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Um, so... And, and uh, it reminded me of something, you know, obviously it's going on now uh, with Russia because the United States um, and uh, even uh, Gloria Duffy, who was the executive director of the Commonwealth Club, she worked in the 90s uh, for the uh, Department of Defense. And she negotiated the, the, the uh, withdrawal of the nuclear weapons from all the out, outer, uh, you know, provinces, so to speak, including the Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Um, and what if that hadn't happened? What, you know, what if all of those Kazakhstan and, and, and the Ukraine and everything kind of grabbed the nuclear weapons that were on their property uh, when everything fell apart? And then we faced uh, the Russia versus Ukraine war. So why don't you why don't you talk about how what's going on in Russia and Ukraine uh, relates to this big history idea of land and the counter scarp near it and how how centers of power discuss, you know, relate to other countries uh, based upon that. And what, what we can expect from this? Can we just expect it to continue on or, or will people give up on the idea? Yeah, well, I think um, if, uh, you know, if you have any doubts about the way that geography is destiny, just ask somebody from Ukraine. And they, mm-hmm. they will tell you, of course, geography is destiny. I mean, the very name of the country means borderland. And it's been mm-hmm. fought over by rival empires, by... Poles and Austrians and Turks and Russians for hundreds and hundreds of years. And um, the it's easy, I think it's easy for us in the West to look at what's happening there and say, oh, you know, Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine because he's crazy. He's this crazy man, mm. this throwback to an earlier era. I think violence is going to solve all his problems. And if we can just get rid of Vladimir Putin, everything will be okay. Mm-hmm. The problem is, and I think Ukrainian leaders recognize very clearly, um, geography 
is always going to make Ukraine a problem for the Russians. That for the last 400 years, Russia's problems have always come from the West. That the Poles burn Moscow in 1610, the Swedes besiege St. Petersburg in 1705, Napoleon burns Moscow again in 1812, Germans almost tear the country apart in 1918, almost do it again in 1941, 42. You would have to be a very dim-witted Russian leader not to say our big problem is the West. And the strategy mm-hmm. they came up with was to push their Western frontier as far to the West into Europe as physically possible. And this is what Vladimir Putin was thinking when he said in 2005, I think it was, that the fall of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. It, it undid 300 years of Russian strategy, brought their border all the way back to within a few hundred kilometers of Moscow, left them extremely vulnerable to pressure from the West. So any Russian leader whatsoever is going to try to neutralize Ukraine because Ukraine is kind of the great threat for Russians. Mm -hmm. But of course, you don't have to do that by invading them. And Mm -hmm. I I would say that the the two challenges for the West in the Ukrainian war, first of all, got to defeat Vladimir Putin. And if if that doesn't happen, then the the whole thing has been a real disaster. I think it's going to encourage a lot more use of violence. So Putin has to be defeated. But then um, Russian leaders have to be somehow brought back into the fold. And it's like a deterrence. It's like a two sided thing. You can deter people by raising the costs of violence so high that the benefits are never going to make it worthwhile. And if you do that, you get a cold war like the one we have with the Soviets. The other way is by raising the benefits of playing nicely so high that the advantages of not playing nicely are never going to match up with it. And I think the, this is Henry Kissinger got himself in a lot of trouble recently recently by saying there's going to have to be a negotiation. There's going to have to be a political settlement here. Mm -hmm. I think this is what he meant. um, The Russians have to be defeated on the battlefield, but then there has to be an agreement that will leave both sides happy enough um, that you're not just going to get another Cold War, another uh, military standoff, because that's what you got with the Germans after 1918, and that didn't end well. Yeah, that that, that wasn't a good idea, and and, uh, we should learn from some of these things in history. So, yes. so basically what you're saying is that the, the geographical problems are insolvable, but, but we can do them with soft power rather than hard, hard power, or we can encourage soft power versus hard power. And so uh, under those circumstances, doesn't seem maybe ill-advised to, to have the Ukraine jump into NATO immediately? Uh, it's, certainly, it's going to entrench the hostility. Um, Mm -hmm. If there are other things that can be done to make the Russians happy with that, then obviously the um, Ukrainians joining NATO is not going to be a problem. There there was a point when Putin himself was talking about Russia joining NATO. So I guess it's not that NATO, so itself has to be an existential threat to the Russians. It's just that it, if the Russians are convinced that they are under attack from the West, then Ukraine joining NATO is a very terrifying prospect for them. Do you think that offering uh, Putin as part of the negotiations that Kissinger was suggesting, that they can join NATO, uh, that the Russians can also join at the same time, um, or some other idea like that, that, that sort of gives the Russians the acknowledgement that they're part of Europe, that they've been looking for for a long time. Do you think that that's part of the soft power that would work? Yes, and of course, it might be that Vladimir Putin is simply not an actor you can have this negotiation with. Mm-hmm. It's like uh, with the, the one of Britain's great blunders in the 1930s was treating Hitler as a normal leader and thinking mm-hmm. this is a man you can have this negotiation with and making it clear to him he can have all of this stuff, a lot of the stuff he's demanding, he can have this as long as he doesn't go to war. Um, mm-hmm. But by giving him all this stuff, it just egged him on to make him keener to go to war, more convinced that the, that the West was never going to stand up to him. And mm-hmm. it might very well be that Vladimir Putin is an actor of the Hitler kind rather than an actor of the, say, the Catherine the Great kind. Catherine the Great mm-hmm. should negotiate with her. Um, if Putin really is an actor of the Hitler kind, then... Um, there's, I think, no possibility of a proper negotiation while he is still the top guy in Russia. Mm. And I think you know, anyone who replaces him, even if Navalny was able to replace Putin, Navalny is still going to think Ukraine is a threat. Mm. But I don't think Navalny is going to conclude that the way to solve the problem is by invading the country. I think that's the kind of thing uh, we have to look for. You know, either believable signs that Vladimir Putin is ready to negotiate and find a settlement, or um, having someone else to negotiate with. 
one of the maps that you had was just a schematic uh, thing that the United States did in, in 1992 after the fall of the Soviet Union, where the United States was in the center of everything. And, and you know, there was a little bit of overlap, but otherwise it was the United States dealing with all the parts of the world uh, independently as if it was the only power. That, that not only seemed uh, unrealistic, but it also seemed, why would you want to put yourself in that position, uh, especially after watching the British having just more or less been in that position for a while? Um, but now we're now we're, we've got another big problem, which, you know, everybody is saying, well, if, if uh, President Xi is, is uh, watching what's going on in Russia and Ukraine, maybe he won't touch Taiwan. But I was in uh, uh, Hong Kong and Taiwan, uh, not Taiwan, Hong Kong and Beijing in 96, um, just a year before the, the take back of Hong Kong under mm-hmm. the agreement that had been done years, many years earlier when I was living there. Um, and. Everywhere the signs were, you know, welcome back, you know, uh, our, our peoples, you know, the, the Hong Kong, the one from Macau and the Taiwanese. They, you, you got the really distinct impression that for their 50th anniversary of the revolution, they wanted everybody back in there. Yes. And, and I got the impression that, and I, this is just a big impression. I got the impression that they were given the 2008 uh, uh, Olympics in order to stop them from, from insisting. So that was a little bit of use of soft power um, to, to give them something. But now we're in a situation where, you know, different leaders, different issues, yeah. um, much more wealth. And as you say in your book, and you said it in your earlier books as well, China was the biggest uh, country uh, in terms of both population and wealth for about 1,500 of the last 2,500 years or so, something like that. Mm-hmm. So it, it, that's the role it used to play even if it didn't go that far away from, from Asia, uh, I, I, maybe, mm-hmm. maybe not counting until the Hun and, you know, the Mongols, you know, that, that, that kind of thing. But in any case, uh, so how do you think China sees this whole counter scarp idea? And you, you, you have a map with the two different Island chains. And let's talk about that just a little bit before we wrap this up, because I think it's a, a great application of your ideas. Yeah, you know, Chinese strategists will often complain that um, <clears throat> the United States, as part of its construction of a new world order after the Second World War, one of the things they did was try to contain China in just the same way that they tried to contain the Soviet Union. And mm-hmm. one of the big tools for containing China is what they call the island chains, basically running down from Japan in the north down to Singapore, even Australia down in the south. And um, these island chains, this is linkage of allies. This gives the United States the potential to cut China off from the outside world. Um, you know, mm-hmm. Use these military bases, project naval power, shut China in by commanding the seas. And um, this is something that Chinese strategists feel this, this cannot be allowed to stand. So long as this stands, China is always a, a second rate power. And so they've got basically two ways they've come up with to deal with it. One is by either subverting or punching a hole through the island chain. So you you win over the government of Korea or you persuade mm. and Japan would be a harder sell, but um, you persuade, uh, say, Singapore to come over to your side or because you can invade Taiwan, bring Taiwan back in forcibly. But one way or another, crack a hole in the island chain so that it's no longer possible for American allies to shut you off in the outside world. But they've, they've found another way as well, uh, which is instead of trying to break through the island chains to outflank the island chains. And these are mm-hmm. these very old strategies. You see powers using both strategies going back to ancient times. And the Chinese version of this is the Belt and Road Initiative. Mm -hmm. You create this chain of infrastructure across Central Asia, coming out on the Indian Ocean, the Mediterranean Sea. And so that even if the US could close off all these choke points around China's Pacific coast, they've still got all this access to the wider world through this chain of allies across Central Asia. And um, a lot of the big uh, sort of political maneuverings of the last 10 years have really been about the U.S. trying to come to terms with the threat of the Belt and Road Initiative and China Mm. trying to talk other powers into abandoning the U.S. alliance so they can dissolve the island chains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the Belt and Road Initiative also is all throughout Africa as well and and even South America. So they're, they're, they're projecting their economic power, the way the Soviet Union and the United States both fought over all those areas and then left them as soon as the Cold War was over. I mean, didn't leave, but what weren't giving away so much money as before, whereas the Chinese seem to be lending the money, probably without expectation of, of uh, returns, and creating all this infrastructure and making things richer all around the world. Um, 
Yeah. Do you think also that there there was some people that talked about how the the missiles sunk uh, the Russian ship uh, in the Black Sea? That that this sea power is coming to an end. That that that, that we command of the seas can encircle an economy and stop it. Well, certainly, a lot of shipping still goes on, you know, uh, for moving goods around the world. But but. Do you think that that is also near the end of its lifespan in terms of where the power will, will, will be lying? Well, I think um, it, it's changing. Uh, like um, and this had already begun over a hundred years ago. There's this um, admiral, a guy named Jackie Fisher in Britain, who a great mm. fan of modernizing, one of the, the big early champions of submarines. And back in 1905, he's already saying, when I've built enough submarines, no German surface fleet will ever dare to venture into the North Sea again. And back in 1905, that was just kind of ridiculous. Um, the submarines just weren't good enough. And uh, admirals figured out all kinds of countermeasures. But now, uh, you know, 115, 120 years on, this is the, the way naval action seems to be going. And through a combination of, of submarines and surface-to-surface -surface missiles, they call, often call them carrier killers. Um, it's Surface fleets are not what they used to be. And we're already in a situation where um, if there were a war in Taiwan, if the US decided to get involved in it, its aircraft carriers would basically have to withdraw from the Chinese coast to the absolute limit of the range of the planes on them to be able to get to Taiwan. And they've been pushed back now. So far, they have to get pushed back any further by these increasingly long range, super accurate Chinese missiles. The aircraft carriers will no longer be any use at all. Mm. So it's just been constantly Go, changing, constantly transformed as the technology changes, as the organization of the great powers changing, what they can afford to build. As all this happens, the geography remains the same, but what it means keeps changing. And one of the things you say is that, uh, that powers like China and Russia say, well, you know, the United, and, and India as well, say the United States has to realize that it, they should be treating us as equals or, or not as equals, at least as too powerful for you to just run over us all the time. Um, and that's a, that's a soft power idea. You, you talk a lot about, you know, the British soft power of today from the Beatles to Harry Potter, for example. And, and you know, the United States has a lot of that soft power too. And I, I, I even noticed that China and, and, and the Korea and so on, they also are developing that kind of cultural soft power mm -hmm. that comes outside of Asia and is going around. And that's, that's a, you know, something in the last 15 years or 10, 20 years that their productions in this area are capturing people everywhere, whether it's just rock groups, it's just, you start with one thing, but it has an influence. So um, we, we should wrap this up, but I, there's a, a good question that came in from George Steffner, um, and it brings us right back to Britain. Um, so that's perfect. Are British natural resources now adequate for its past empire supplied population increases? Does it have enough production to trade for its extra domestic needs? Yeah. Um, one thing that people in Britain sometimes forget, uh, they're, they're like people in a lot of countries, they tend to swerve back and forth between extreme self-confidence and extreme self-doubt. And <laughs> Britain do sometimes still forget that Britain remains you know, one of the 10 biggest economies in the world, one mm -hmm. of the, the, the world's great powerhouses. It's not the dominant player in the world anymore, but it's one of the major powers. Um, mm -hmm. Britain... Uh, its relationship with the empire economically was a very complicated kind of thing. And in certain ways, the empire was massively important for British economic and military success. In other ways, I mean, one of the reasons the empire dissolves so quickly um, during the 20th century is that increasingly British leaders are realizing that the empire does not pay anymore. And mm. particularly when you, you think about it in a geostrategic balance, when you think about the, the costs of empire, it's not only sending troops out there to garrison it, it's also what it costs you in terms of prestige, the damage it does um, to you in the eyes of your allies, all these different things. They started adding this up. They created a balance sheet of empire in the 1950s and said, you know, the empire simply doesn't pay. The empire mm. has to go. And um, that will actually make Britain better off. But of course, creates this new question for the British, how do we organize the world in which we are no longer at the center of this global empire? And then really in a lot of ways, the last 60, 70 years of British history have been about trying to figure this out. Um, like this is this famous line that Dean Acheson, the uh, former Secretary of State, said in 1962, he gave this speech at West Point, and he said, Great Britain has lost an empire, but not yet found a role. And he mm -hmm. was absolutely right 
So in some ways, Brexit is part of this ongoing discussion of what is Britain's role on the global stage? Should it be as part of a larger European continent? Is that the best role for Britain? Should it be sort of under the American wing, the way it had been through the middle of the 20th century? Is that the best place? Is it possible to forge an independent path between the Amer- North American and West European, these great piles of money in these places? Can something be done, some sort of union of the English-speaking people with the Canadians and Australians and New Zealanders, which Mm. is very popular in right-wing circles in Britain. Um, Unfortunately, most Canadians, Australians and New Zealanders seem never (laughs) even to have heard of this idea. Idea. It's just ridiculous. Or should Britain actually cozy up to China? Is mm-hmm. that the way forward? And in the early 2010s, actually, it looked like the Conservative Party was moving in that direction, at least as far as saying a closer relationship with China will help us balance out American power and make it easier for Britain to pursue a middle course between these great superpowers dominating the globe. And I would say you know, that is the great question on the British plate at the moment. And that is the question historians of the future will ask when they are trying to judge Brexit. They won't say, what did this mean for Britain in terms of its relationship with Brussels? They'll say, what did this mean for Britain in terms of its relationship with Beijing? Mm. Did it make it easier for the British to succeed in a world that is increasingly tilting toward the East, or did it not? I mean, that is ultimately going to be the question. It's kind of ironic uh, if that happens, uh, because um, the colony, Hong Kong, which was taken by the British, was given back by the British. And through that colony, uh, the Brits might be pulled into, you know, the Chinese empire. So that so that grabbed a piece, the piece was grabbed back. And then uh, certainly the pressure on Australia uh, feels that way. Um, and one other thing uh, to, to, to wrap this up that you're talking about, it seems to me that Democracy is making soft power more, as democracy is more popular, even though right now it's going downhill, but uh, in terms of use, um, but it's still an idea that keeps spreading uh, as something that people want, you know, a little bit more control over their lives rather than being dictated to. Um, and that, that democratic uh, decentralization of power means soft power should be more valuable. But when you were talking just a, a little while ago about the British thinking about their empire and how, how, how they should do it this way and use a little bit more soft power. And maybe it's better to not have an empire, but just to have a, an economic union. It reminded me of, I'm sure it was, you know, more than one person at a time, but 5,000 years ago, somebody must've started saying, you know, when we beat another side in a war, if we just enslave them rather than kill them all, we might actually get an advantage out of that. And, and that, was, that was another advance for, for, for human culture over time, instead of just massacring everybody. Slavery obviously is not where we're, I mean, that's still an advance that we've advanced far past. Um, but it was an advance at the time over, over the total destruction of whoever you went into. So, so mm-hmm. you kind of with your big history, give us a little hope maybe that it, you know, democratization will, will increase soft power and a little bit less violence. It's like your other, your other uh, books from the past pointing out, you know, I'm going to finish with that, what, uh, the violence, the, the degradation of violence, that we used to live much more violent lives uh, or violent deaths. The, the numbers on that are stunning. So why don't, why don't you give everybody a little bit of hope from this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, um, yeah, I wrote a book that came out in 2014 about the history of violence called War, What Is It Good For? And um, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly depressing book because it's a fairly depressing topic to work on. But there is this one extraordinarily positive thing in the long term history of violence. Um, every species of, or almost every species of animal on earth has evolved to be able to use violence, to use force, to settle their disputes and to get what they want from the world. So like if you're a lion, you use violence all the time because you're a carnivore, you kill things and you eat them. Um, even animals like deer, you know, they fight over things that they want. Humans, just the same. We evolved to be able to use violence to solve our problems. And so far as we can tell, we always have used violence. But the one thing that makes us completely different from all the other animals is that we also evolved to have brains powerful enough to create and keep developing culture. And we don't have to, like other animals can change the way they behave by evolving biologically into a new kind of animal. And we do that too. We're constantly doing this. But we can also change the way we 
behave, change the way that we do things. And we have done that so spectacularly over the last 10,000 years that your chances of dying violently, the sort of average around the entire planet over the last 10, 15 years, your chances of dying violently are less than one tenth of what they would have been 10,000 years ago. Because we've just found all these other ways to solve our problems. And basically, again, it's this sort of cost-benefit thing I kept talking about during our conversation, that the costs of settling your disagreements violently have gone up and up and up. And the gains from doing it have gone down and down and down. And um, in my book, I suggest the main reason that happened is that we created governments that got so powerful that they basically scared us straight. The governments <laughs> don't want everybody to sort of get on and do their job and pay their taxes so the people in the government can steal all that money and spend it on mistresses and, <laughs> and, and whatever. That's what they want. They don't want us fighting each other and burning down all the productive assets and so on. And so they offer us a deal. They say, you get on with your job. We will protect you against your neighbours and also we'll protect your neighbors against you. And if you go beat up your neighbor, we will come down with much more force than you can ever muster. And we will kill you. And we will destroy your home and sell your family into slavery. And of course, mm-hmm. when they put it like that, most people say, hmm, yeah, I, I think I'll go. I'll take <laughs> to the point is because we now to a great degree have internalized this. And so if you and I had a serious disagreement in this discussion, in no way either this is going to kill each other over this. <laughs> because we know the costs vastly outweigh the benefits of doing this. And you're younger and taller. Problem <laughs> we've done this by making governments so powerful they can sort of scare us all straight. But governments that powerful can also destroy the entire planet if they want to. So it's kind of this, this to, too much Yeah, you were supposed to end with optimism. Now you just <laughs> <laughs> well, the optimism, of course, is so far, so far we haven't. You know, if, yes. if we haven't destroyed that, if we had had this conversation 50 years ago, um, and oh, yeah. I said, you know, the Cold War is going to end and there'll be no nuclear exchange. There will not be billions of people dead. We'll not end life on the planet. A few hundred people are going to die. And the Russians are going to say, oh, this whole communism thing, we don't like it anymore. We're just going to give it up. You would have thought I was mad if I'd said yeah. that. Yeah, that's basically what happened. And I think that is like the most optimistic story in the history of the entire planet. Excellent. Okay. Well, that's a great way to end <laughs> another conversation you know, at the Commonwealth Club. So thank you very much for joining us. And so ends another event at the Commonwealth Club in its 120th year of enlightened discussion. Thanks for joining us. And we hope to see you again, either on YouTube or on our live stream program. Thanks for joining us. Thanks again, Ian. Well, thanks so much for having me here.